Amen. Our message today is called, Where Are You? Where are you? Now, I don't know about you, but um, let me ask you a question. How many of you in here have ever ridden in a car with Floyd Dodder? Okay. Not that he's a bad driver. Okay. When we're on our way to Oklahoma and we're looking at signs, I mean, we already know where we're going for the most part, but there's been times when Michelle has been driving and Floyd's sleeping and I make a wrong turn. And I'm like, oh, why are we here? Where am I? I don't know how to get where I'm going if I don't know where I am. So what do we have to do in that situation? Keep driving and not ask for help? All right, how many of you guys in here would actually keep driving and not ask for help? Okay, Melanie, yeah, okay. Seriously, we stop and we ask for help or we take out our handy dandy iPhone and get our little GPS out or we'll turn our GPS on. We'll find out where we are and then we can say, oh yeah, that's how I get where I'm going, right? Okay. Well, this body is like a vehicle and you're driving through life. Do you know where you're going? Do, do you know where you're headed? I'm not talking about just salvation here, folks. I'm talking about the things we do today affect our tomorrow. Where are we going? Do we even know where we are? And what I wanted to do today is just kind of walk through the Word of God with you. We're not going to be here till 4 o'clock in the afternoon, but... Walk through the Word of God and take it from, like, Genesis on. One thing I have seen is in the beginning in the garden, God wanted what? Relationship with his people. Where were they? In the garden. All the way to Revelation. What is he looking for? Relationship forever and ever in heaven with him. From beginning to end, it's the same thing. God is a God of purpose. He created every single one of us in here for a special purpose, and that is to have a relationship with him. Scripture says in John that my sheep will know my voice. My sheep will know my voice. And as we get closer to him in prayer, as we spend quality time with him in prayer, we will begin to hear his voice. Sometimes it's like, whoa, that dude said he heard from God. And we look at people like they're a freak because they heard from God. But guess what? If we as Christians are not hearing from God and we don't know the voice of God, hello, my sheep know my voice, and of another they will not follow. We have to get to a point in our walk with him that we know his voice. That goes hand in hand with where we are. So let's just talk about a couple of things in Scripture as we go through from Genesis to Revelation. Everybody ready? You got your seatbelts on, ready to go. We're on a ride. Ready? All right. Number one, here's Adam and Eve in this wonderful garden. That God created. You have the Garden of Eden. Let's look at this little root word here called Eden. Each of these locations that we're going to talk about, I do have some meanings for. This is what the Garden of Eden means, and all of these are in the Hebrew unless I tell you otherwise. The root word means to delight or have pleasure. Melanie, I will give you my notes later. There's some of you in here that always, <laughs> she's like frantically writing. If you need copies of this for anyone that's on the DVD, the tape, or anything, you can call me at Vertical Research, um, and I'll be happy to get you a copy, 843-452-0884. All right. Eden also means to be soft or pleasant, figuratively, Basically to relax, to live voluptuously, and to delight in oneself. Now, I don't know about you, but the Garden of Eden sounds pretty nice. 
all of their needs were supplied in the Garden of Eden. Do you believe your needs are supplied? Wait a minute. Where are you? Uh, wait a minute now. Where are you? You are in the Garden of Eden. Did you know that? Spiritually, you have been given every single thing you need in the spirit realm from God himself to live a spiritual life, just like they were given everything they needed in the natural. Where are you? What was that that, as he walked in the cool of the day, what did he ask? Oh, Adam, where are you? Now, what's the matter? God's got a bad memory. He doesn't know where Adam is. What was he trying to do? Provoke Adam for him to realize where he was. So we're, we're camping out right here in Eden spiritually. Where are you? Do you really know that you're in Eden? That you've been provided every good thing in the spirit? Every good thing from God himself. So I ask, where are you? Do you know that you know that you know that he will provide everything you need according to whose riches? Pastor Bob's riches in glory, right? Whose? God's riches. And guess what? If this earth is like a little speck of dust in a little sunlight beam, he's got a lot of riches for that little speck of dust, I think. Everybody agree there? All right. One of the things that, as we look through Scripture, we find the Israelites, you know, you have Adam and Eve, you know, they had their babies, you had Noah and the ark, and all that stuff, and as you go through the book of Genesis, you end up with this wonderful family of people, Jacob and his sons, all these children, and God's had spoke to Abraham. Abraham had Isaac. What did Isaac mean? He laughs. Ha <laughs> ha Laughter is his medicine, so he's blessing his people. Next thing you know, Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has all these kids, 12 sons. God promised that Abraham's seed would be as the sands of the seashore, as the stars of the sky. And this was the foundation that he had, those 12 sons. And what he did is he blessed them. And one thing after another, after another, you know, Joseph, one of the youngest, second to the youngest child, was put in captivity in Egypt because his sons sold him because he, they thought, oh, wow, Joseph, you're so prideful. You keep telling us about these dreams where everything's bowing down to you. Ooh, let's not touch you because you're just all that. Ooh. So they got all upset with him, you know, the whole sibling rivalry thing. So they take Joseph and they throw him in this well. And one of the sons of Jacob are thinking, well, maybe I can go save him later. Oh, no. They had other plans for uh, Joseph. They sold him. They sold him to some traitors that were passing through. So he ends up away from his family in a totally different land. Captivity in Egypt. Here's his brothers. What are we going to tell dad? They take his beautiful coat of many colors, throw a bunch of blood on it, and hand it to dad. Here, dad, your son's been killed, apparently. His dad lost it. Jacob cried for his son, longed for his son, could not believe that this, wonder, this, this wonderful child that God had given him by his favorite woman, Rachel, was dead. So here the promises that he thought God had given him were ended. Where are you, Jacob? What did I promise you, Jacob? Does it look like the promises that God has said are gone? Do you feel? Oh, well, I don't feel like the promises of God are still there. What does it have to do with feeling? Well, they gave me this blooded up coat. He must be dead. Oh, when God promises something, he's God enough to bring it to pass. So, long story short, 
One thing leads to another. God elevates Joseph to the second in command in Egypt because he interpreted a dream of the king. And the king's like, well, since you definitely told me that you think we're going to have all this famine and we need to store food, how about you handle the storehouse? You take care of that. He got pulled out of a dungeon cell to take care of all that. So here comes Joseph serving the king, serving the people. And one day when the famine was so great, his, son, his brothers, not knowing who they were talking to, had to come to the head of the storehouse in Egypt. Here's Joseph. Those are my brothers. And so he starts asking them questions. Is there any other children? Did, you know, what about your father? Where does he live? Is he well? So after all that happens, he reveals himself to them at some point. They go back. They get dad. He's excited, can't believe, oh my gosh, my, my child is alive. Oh yeah, the promises of God. All those years he grieved, Lord, why did you make this happen? You promised me. But yet, but yet, God fulfilled his promise. It doesn't matter what we think. Our thinking becomes our reality a lot of times, and we forget who we are and where we are. Joseph had his father and all his brothers move to the land of Goshen. I'd like for us to look at this map up here. We're not going to labor on this too much as far as the map, but if you look up here, way up there where the little purple arrows are going crazy, here's Egypt. Goshen is right there in that wonderful land between the water. Can everyone see that okay, for the most part? Now, Goshen's name means this, approaching or drawing near. Approaching or drawing near to what? Okay, here you have this beautiful land here in Goshen. The reason that they moved there and not right smack dab in the middle of Egypt is because they were shepherds. They had this beautiful pasture, and that area is very uh, luscious because of the waterfall and the, the streams that are there and everything else. So they had their sheep that needed to graze. Where were they? Goshen, in a land that's close to an area where they can be provided for. Joseph told him, I don't want you to stay out there in la-la land where it's all dead and dry and there's not going to be any food. You move here closer to me. So, yay, I like that little pointer, whoever did that. Um, so there they moved to Goshen, which is uh, an area still in Palestine, and it means approaching or drawing. That area right there, Goshen, actually became part of Palestine when Joshua conquered it for the Israelites later on. That's another thing we can dig out later. Does anyone in here know what Egypt means? It means hemmed in. People look at it like a, a place of the world. Now, rewind. A lot of people understand this in the spiritual realm. Here we are, naturally, as Christians, we're sitting here. We went from the kingdom of darkness, when we were not saved, the Holy Spirit took us out of the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of light, okay, where we are saved. Now, when you look in scripture, they were in a kingdom of darkness in Egypt after they were in Goshen. They were taken captive in Egypt. They were made slaves because Pharaoh was like, whoa, these people are really growing in number. They're getting large and I'm scared. I don't want them to take over my entire area. So they started making them slaves. That's symbolic of a land of darkness. And you can see Egypt on this side. This middle portion here is actually where um, Moses crossed the Red Sea and came into this area. This is the wilderness area that they actually traveled in after they were delivered from Egypt. And then this over here is considered the promised land, which most of us can look at this map and see, Israel is on that side later on, 1948. Now, 
We as Christians, from the land of darkness into the kingdom of light, when you are in the kingdom of light, you are walking with God. It doesn't end. You're walking through your life here on earth. Being in earth is like a wilderness to us. We're not of this world. Scripture says that we are not of this world. We are a peculiar people. We're kind of like the crazy folk. We're peculiar to so many people. When we gave our hearts to the Lord, we came out of bondage, and we were transferred into the kingdom of light. We were set free, totally set free. How many of you in here have given your heart to the Lord, and you actually know that you know that you know that you're set free? Amen? Now, where are you? Are you over here in Egypt, hemmed in? Chained up, can't move, don't know where to go, not saved, don't know God, don't care about God, don't want nobody talking to you about God? Are you hemmed in? Are you hiding yourself? Are you in the wilderness area? Moses was a type of Jesus. Okay? Moses led the people through the wilderness into the promised land. Jesus leads us as Christians every day as we walk with him, talk with him on our walk into heaven. Are you in the wilderness? And this is the question. If you're in the wilderness, where are you in the wilderness? Did you know that there are so many different places that they stopped? They stopped to rest. They stopped to complain. They stopped to get the commandments. They stopped to eat manna. What is that? Well, that's what manna means. What is that? Let's talk about some of those places. If you know that you're saved and you're not in the kingdom of darkness, let's talk about this wilderness area that we might be walking in right now. Like I said, we're not of this world. Let's just camp out right there for a minute and let's just see where we are. One of the first places they stopped at was Mara, M-A-R-A-H. This location, this, the meaning of that, that word is actually bitter, angry, bitterness, discontentment. Here they had seen what God did crossing the Red Sea into the wilderness, but they were still not happy. Are you in the kingdom of God and still not happy because you don't have what you think God should give you? Oh, wait a minute. But you're in Eden, remember? You've been blessed. You've been blessed. But do we have the mentality that we're living in Mara? Do we have the mentality that we're living in this other place? I don't have the food I need. What did he do, bring us out here to die? It's hot. It's a desert. It's a wilderness out there. Where are you? Where are we here? Are we in Eden believing that God has given us those promises? Or are we camping out in the wilderness? I don't really want to be here. I'm hot. Lord, I'm a youth leader. I hear things, and I'll tell you what. I'm hungry. Teenagers, they eat nonstop. I'm hungry. Feed me. Okay. Are we in that location? Well, in Exodus 15, 23, Exodus 15, 23, that's where they were. Then in Exodus 15, 27, they came to Elam, E-L-I-M. It says they came to Elam, where the twelve wells of water and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. Oh, let's just stay here, Lord. Let's just stay right here in Elam. These wonderful palm trees, way in the just water and everything we need is just so lovely here. In our Christian walk, are we just in that place where we don't want anything else to happen? We're just happy right here. Everything's just wonderful, Lord. Don't tell me, 
to go help with Martha's closet. I got my own little ministry right here. I'm happy with my palm trees. I like my palm trees. I like my water. Don't ask me to mow the lawn, and please, Lord, don't make me put my hip boots on and go clean out the ditch. All right? Where are you? Are you in Elam camped out? And God is saying, come on. You're never going to make it to the promised land if you don't trust me. Trust me. Remember, have Eden mentality. You've been given everything you need, whether you're with the palm trees or whether you're near the bitter waters. You still have been given everything you need, no matter how you feel. Oh, come on now. How many women we have up in here? We know what emotions are like. We've all talked about PMS. We're not going to go down that road. We know how our emotions go crazy and how, and I'm not saying every woman's like that. I'm not trying to lock us in a box, but we are more emotional. We have more sensitivity levels to certain things. Do we camp out there? Sometimes. I love you, honey. That's why you're married, to get your husband to help you stay in line, right? All right, let's talk about the next place they go after they left Elam. Ha, huh, how many people like to know what Elam means? Oh, we have a couple of hands. Great, we're on the right track. It says it means strength. Anything strong. A pilaster, a pilaster. Do you say it? Pilaster. P-I-L-A-S-T-E-R. Mighty, strong support. Oak, ever hear that? That mighty oak. A post. All right. Let's see what happens after they left Elam, because they did have to leave Elam. How are they going to get over here if they don't keep moving? Let's look at Exodus 16, verse 1 through 2. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin. Sin, or zin, Z-I-N, is also another translation. That is not sin as in we, in our language, use it, okay? It's a different meaning. I'll explain. They came to the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. We know what happens at Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after departing out of the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured, against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Okay, so they go from Mara being bitter and angry, and I can't drink this water because it's nasty. They go to this wonderful place of Elam they don't really want to leave, and now they're in another place called the wilderness of sin. And they're angry. They're upset with Moses and Aaron. What'd you do, bring us out here to die? Now they're blaming them, you know? Where's the food we need? We're in the middle of nowhere. So they murmured against God. And guess what God did? He gave them meat and bread, manna and quail falling from the sky. Now, I don't know about you. How many of you guys like to grocery shop? I don't really like to grocery shop. If I go once... In a few weeks, I'm, I'm okay. I do not like to grocery shop. Can't stand it. But how would you like to grocery shop every day? Every morning, you have to go outside, get your groceries, go cook it. Go back out the next day, get your groceries, and cook it. Well, that's what they did, and they complained about that too. Oh, First, they thought it was the coolest thing. God sent this bread from heaven, and he sent the quail. But now, they're complaining because the, it's the same thing every day. How many of the kids would like to eat ice cream every day? After a while, they may not like it. <laughs> I, wait a minute. Now, Linda raised her hand. <laughs> I did see that out of the corner of my eye. Beautiful. So they eventually are, you know, the wilderness of sin is actually uh, covers a span of area, and there's several locations in that area that we'll talk about. Rephidim, in Exodus 17:1, the meaning of Rephidim is comfort. 
another comfortable place. It's almost like a pattern. We are in a terrible place, and then it's wonderful. And then we go back into another place, and then it's wonderful. And then we go into another place, and then it's wonderful. Have you seen the pattern yet? But what never changes God's provision. It never changes. Never. We might think it does, but it doesn't change. Where are we? Here. Are we in the Garden of Eden? Do we really believe that that's where we are in the provision of God? All right. So Rephidim means comfort. They move on from there to Massa, M-A-S-S-A-H, in Exodus 17, 7. It means to test, attempt, prove, tempt, try. Also means controversy. So in this wilderness of Zen, you've got Rephidim and Massa, and these two areas are so close together as they're traveling to Mount Sinai that they're going, they're, they're emotional wrecks, for lack of a better way to put it. One minute they're okay with Moses and Aaron, the next second they're not. God, at that point, begins to speak to Moses and says, look, there are some things that we need to get straight with the people here. If they will follow after me and obey my word, I will bless them. I will make them a great nation. There's many promises with obedience. And he called Moses to deliver the word to the people to obey. Do you know what Mount Sinai is called? The mountain of the sword. In the Jewish encyclopedia, they went into the root meanings, and Sinai means the mountain of the sword. The sword, wow, the word of God is a sword? Pretty cool, huh? Mountain of the sword. So here they are, the mountain of the sword. I like saying that, the mountain of the sword. It just sounds like wow. Let's look at hmm, chapter 19, verse 4. We're still in Exodus. And I'd like to read this. We don't have much more to go through, but I did want to read over a couple of these verses. These are really important. God told Moses, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you into myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel." So now Moses knows what to say. So Moses came and called the elders of the people, and he laid before their faces all the words which the Lord had commanded them. Now how is he laying that before their faces? He had to have written it down somewhere. And he's showing them this is what God said. In verse 8, and all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They came into a covenant agreement at that moment, and Moses returned the words of the people to the Lord. And it was during that time in Exodus 20 that the Ten Commandments were given. A lot of times we look at those Ten Commandments and we think, wow, I haven't killed anybody. I guess I'm okay there. Well, I haven't really been coveting anything. I'm pretty happy with what I have. I don't think I really need to keep the Sabbath day holy, though. I mean, most of us look at that and we think, go to church on Sunday, that's what it means. That is not the inclusive only meaning of keeping the Sabbath day holy. The Lord worked for six days, and on the seventh he rested. You want to live a long life? Obey the Ten Commandments, which means on that seventh day you rest. Does that mean we rest on Sunday, Saturday, Monday, Wednesday? Thank you. We don't have to be religious about it. If you got to work on Sunday but you're off on Saturday, let Saturday be your day of rest. Pick a day. 
Pick a day, any day. One out of seven. All right, folks? Because no one sin is any greater than any other. All sin is what? Sin. Oh, wow. And we thought it was okay just to work nonstop and just go to an early grave, right? Let's take a day of rest, guys. Where are you? Garden of Eden. Mentally, we need to be in the Garden of Eden. God has given us everything that we need. However, there are certain things that we need to obey. If we want to be refreshed, if we want to have strength, if we want to be able to overcome and do the things we're supposed to do, the Ten Commandments. Let's just start there in Exodus 20. That's, you know, let's read those and obey those, and God will continue to bless us. Amen? All right, Deuteronomy 7, verse 1. Now, here they are, wandering in the wilderness... I say wandering because don't you think it would have been really cool if they could have just went boop instead of all the 40 years they spent wandering around? How many of you would like to say, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I just want to go to heaven right now. Most of the older folks raised their hands. Wow. I mean, we want to hurry up and get there. I want to go there. But there is a reason that he has us in the wilderness because we need to know where we are. He knows where we are like he knew where Adam was. He wants us to know where we are. That's the relationship, folks. That's the relationship. Romans 6. <laughs> Read Romans 6. It's chock full of stuff on how we die to our flesh daily, how God's changing us from the inside out. That's where the relationship comes. Listen, if God puts his finger on an area that he's working on, don't run away from him. Run to him. Run to him. Let him show you those areas. I mean, King David's going down the road one day, and some dude comes out and is like, cussing him out, saying, you bad person, you did this and this and this and this and this. And man, David's uh, soldiers are like, hey, you want me to run him through right now? And David said, no. He was sent by God. And if God sent him, who am I to run, have you run him through? We as people get so antsy. Oh, well, you tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do. I'll do what I want. They called me and told me I did something wrong. Really? Who doesn't do anything wrong? What do I always say? Flesh is flesh. It doesn't matter whose bones it's on. It's going to act the same way. It's going to act the same way. Is Pastor Bob's flesh perfect? Now, don't you go. You just hurt his feelings now. Yeah, ask Susan, he says. Is your flesh perfect? No. Now, do you really want people coming up, pointing out every area and every flaw? No. Let's be lovely about this. You know, we all have a little extra we can get rid of sometimes, but, you know, let's be kind to one another. Do not, okay, the Holy Spirit convicts us. It's a gentle, hey, guess what? You know, that's not the smartest thing to do. And you're like, yeah, but I want to do it. But really, it's not the smartest thing to do. Okay, I submit. I won't do it. And you just obeyed the Holy Spirit. When you're obedient to Holy Spirit, you're not grieving the Spirit of God. The sin that's not forgiven is when we blaspheme the Holy Spirit. The word blaspheme means, are you ready to push him away? It doesn't mean to cuss about the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you Holy Spirit, blah, blah, blah. No, blaspheme means to push him away. Whoo! If we're in the wilderness in our walk with the Lord and the Holy Spirit puts a finger on something and says, where are you? And you push him away. You just blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And guess what? That sin will not be forgiven unless you get it right and yield to him. That will stay with you. 
stay with you until you yield to him and repent. Then it's gone. All sin. What do you think Jesus just died for? All sin but that, right? See, that scripture has been so twisted in the body of Christ. Jesus died on the cross for all our sin but one. Really? Is, does the Bible contradict itself? Some translations do. Jehovah Witness has a translation called the New World Translation. It's just the worst one they've got. Yeah. There's so many translations out there. Be a, what now? Seek the word. Seek the Lord. Be a doer of the word, but study to show yourself approved. Not unto men, but unto God. Unto God. As you study the word, it's a mirror. It's a mirror. You're looking in the mirror. You're reading the word. <gasps> oh, wait a minute. I just saw something. I've been doing that, and it says not to do that. You mean I really do have to rest one day a week? But I got... <sighs> but it... <sighs> All right. I submit, Lord. Ah, now we have obedience... And when there's obedience and we obey his words and his commandments, now what happens? We reap the benefits. We reap the benefits. Now in Deuteronomy 7 verse 1, let's read that one. It says, when the Lord thy God shall bring you into the land which you go to possess... And cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Seven nations greater and mightier than you. What do you mean greater and mightier than me? Lord, I thought you were my God. What are they, greater and mightier than me? Really? That means they're larger in number. Large, large number. Let's go to the next screen here. Did you know if you do a study, studying to show yourself approved, and you th look at each, whoops, no, sorry, that, yeah, thank you. Each of those seven, there's the meanings of them. Okay, Melanie, write fast. Um, <laughs> no, we'll leave it up there for you. Each of these seven have meanings. Now, remember what this verse just said. When the Lord shall bring you into the land which you are going to possess... And all these nations are cast out before you. There are seven of them, mightier and stronger, but you still have to deal with them. He didn't say, okay, you know, you're saved. I'm going to come inside of you, just live inside of you and through you, and everything's going to be wonderful. You don't have to work for anything. It's just a breeze, like camping out by the palm trees. No. He says there's seven that are greater and mightier in number than you that you have to overcome. But there's a long list of things that he wants us to do with these seven. These are the strongholds we have to fight in our walk with the Lord to accomplish possession of the promised land. Hear me out. It doesn't mean I'm working to get to heaven and I've got to overcome all these things to get to heaven. That's not what I'm saying. In us, this is the land that needs to be conquered, amen? This land needs to be conquered. Flesh is flesh, doesn't matter whose bones it's on. These things need to be conquered in our lives. If I can say that these seven that are listed here, these are the root meanings of each of these, these people here, these groups of people. If we can overcome these in our lives, I truly believe these are strongholds. Everything else is everything else. Have you ever had to deal with pride? Oh, what about this one? The very last thing on the list, uncleanness. That's anything from pornography, masturbation, sex outside of marriage, adultery, you name it. That one right there? All of these are strongholds. But while we're fighting, I say fighting, spiritual warfare here, we're gaining ground. 
We have more room for God to flow. Another area, okay, Lord, let's deal with that Amorite, that murmuring. Man, my feet hurt. I did say that a couple times yesterday, and I went, whoa, wait a minute, I can't be saying that. And God starts saying, quit murmuring. I submit. Wait a minute, there's more room for him to flow. No more pride. God's dealing with the pride. Okay, Lord, I submit. More room for him to flow. The next thing you know, you can walk a life where, as Pastor Bob says, he has done a work for us at the cross. Now he's doing a work in us like he's doing in the wilderness, and he will do a work, what? Through us to reach others. So where are you? Are we in a place where we really believe the promises of God and we allow the Holy Spirit to do the work of the inside of us and we yield to him daily, yield to him daily and continue to let him flow through us? Okay, I want you to go uh, lay hands on so-and-so and pray for him. If I called you out right now, if I called, say, say I called Joe, you don't have to come up, but I'm just saying. If I said, Joe, you know, have a seat. All right, now I'm going to call someone to pray for Joe. You nervous yet? Oh, I got to pray out loud. All of a sudden, 500 people run to the bathroom. (laughs) There's a pile up in the hall. But Jacob's still here because he knows how to pray. Amen? All right. Overcoming these areas in our life are so important. But how are we going to overcome them? Relationship. Joshua chapter 1, over and over and over and over again, the Lord says to Joshua, let's turn there. Joshua, this will be one of our last scriptures here. Joshua 1. I'll be reading from the King James Version. If you'd like to share um, on the screen, that would be great, Rick. I'll try to stay in one spot so you don't have to chase me all over the place. Joshua, chapter 1. Oops. Got to love a phone. All right. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass, and the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise. Now, wait. Moses was a type of Christ. Joshua is a type of us as the body of Christ. And what did the Lord say? Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, we all know Jesus is alive, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father, but he's not here on earth right now. Now, therefore, arise. Go over this Jordan, thou and all the people. Unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given to you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, uh, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. The great sea is the Mediterranean Sea, by the way. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. Be, all right, everyone say this together. Be strong and of good courage. One more time, say that same thing. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do accordingly to the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. I love that word. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Whoa, did we miss that? 
observe to do according to all that is written therein. Does that mean we have to be perfect? No, but observe what we're doing and at least acknowledge if maybe it's, you know, and repent when we have to. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Let's read number nine together. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Say that again. Whithersoever. That's here, tither, whither, thither. That's a great song. All right, youth, you got a song to write, okay? Whithersoever. All right. Verse 10, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, pass through the host, and he went on to command them what to do in order to accomplish what God had spoken to him. Now, I said I was going to take you through Revelations. So you, you got your, uh, your speed booster on? You ready? Whoa! After this happened, they went into, we can go back to the map, sir. They went into the promised land, into the land of Israel. They began to divide the land up, northern land and the southern land at some point. They were all one at time. They divided up. The Assyrians came in and captured the northern part of what we see as today, nor, uh, Israel is what we call it today. And Babylonians captured the southern part of what is known as Israel. The people, do you, can anyone remember why they kept getting taken into captivity? They're in captivity in Egypt. They went in captivity with the Assyrians. Disobedience and idolatry. Idolatry. Number one, idolatry. Something above God. They didn't have to be a little golden calf. Whoa, the golden calf. It came out of the fire. There it was. Okay, have you ever seen that? It wasn't just an idol or a tangible thing. It was anything they put above God. Did you know that we can live our lives day in and day out and say we are Christians and we believe in God, but we don't hear from him and we don't know his voice? If we're in that state and we're like, oh, I haven't really heard from you in a long time, Lord. Talk to my heart. Speak to my heart. Start opening up to him. I can almost guarantee you that if you haven't heard his voice in a while, that the reason is very clear. What separates us from God? sin. And what we do is we go back in prayer. Father, show me. What was it that I did way over there that affected my today? That caused me to pull away from you? What did I do that caused me to be separated from you? They were separated from their promised land because of this.